Hi, Daniel. <laughs> hey, I like your you? background. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, let me do an introduction, uh, and then we'll okay. get going. Um, Great. Thanks to all of you for joining. Uh, I'm Melvin Chen. I'm the director of the Norfolk Chamber Music Festival, and I'm delighted to have uh, be able to have another conversation with the composer, violinist, musician, Daniel Bernard Rumain, whose uh, premiere we will hear this summer at the Norfolk Festival. So thank you for your time, Daniel. It's always oh, nice pleasure. to see you. <laughs> Great to see you, too. Great to see you. Too. Let me turn on the light right here. Yeah. There we go. Sorry about so, that. So I thought, uh, you know, I, I want to, people to get to know you, um, in, especially in terms of your artistry, your musicianship, um, to talk about um, how you developed as a musician, what your, what your childhood uh, musical experiences were like, and we can contrast them with mine. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I mean, we, you know, we both, I know that we, we both play the violin. Um, I had no choice in the matter that my parents put a violin in my hand when I was three and sent me wow. off to Suzuki. Wow. How, you did you, play? how did you, yeah, sometimes. Yeah, I, don't, oh, I wouldn't okay. say I, I practice much, but I play. Oh, that's uh, great. How'd you, how'd you end up with the violin? Uh, a little more choice. <laughs> uh, can you hear me okay? Yeah. A little more choice, a little more choice. Uh, it was part of the um, part of the educational program at Margate Elementary School um, in the 1970s. I'm 50 years old, so in the 1970s, most elementary schools in Broward County, South Florida, where I'm from, had orchestral programs, um, you know, real instruments, woodwinds, a few brass, mainly strings. And I, uh, I, I would say the violin chose me. So I was very anxious to play the instrument, brought it home, took it out of the case. I didn't know what rosin was. I put it on the strings, I remember. <laughs> Nobody told me, you know, it was the first day I had the instrument. And, uh, but a great music teacher, Mr. Miller, fantastic music teacher. Um, um, you know, everyone had full size instruments. There were no quarter size or anything. And yeah, I, I, I was lucky enough to be born at that time, in that place, um, in that town, and um, got lucky that. Uh, and how old were you when you when you first? Five. I was five. Hey, you were playing. You were playing a full size instrument. Are you serious? At five. Oh, we all were. Yes. Oh my God. That's all he had. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it was free. Free instrument. A lesson once a week. Free. A music wow. book. Uh, all the books that we needed. Free. As far as I know, they were free. I don't. You know, whatever it was, it was marginal uh, cost. And uh, yeah, the Margate Strings. In fact, I need to research this. I may be the last one. I may be the last, I don't know if anybody's out there, do the research, I should Google search it. Um, I may be, I hadn't thought about this, Melvin. I mean, I might be the last person from that program still professionally, if you will, playing the violin. That would be interesting. Do you I, keep in touch with, you, with your friends from elementary school? Yeah, there's a few, Melissa Cole. <laughs> <laughs> She's really the only one. She, but you know, she doesn't play anymore. Uh, I mean, not professionally, I don't think. Uh, but we're still really good friends. Um, uh -huh. I kind of hope I'm not the only one. I don't know. I hope I'm not the only one. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say to to all of you listening, if you if you have any questions uh, you'd like to to pose, you know, be, uh, feel free to click the Q and A button at the at the bottom and and type in your question, and we'll get to it. Yeah. And um, so. Continuing with that, my my parents basically um, at home, they, we only had classical music on the radio. That's all I listened oh, to. My. I grew up with no uh, knowledge of pop music or anything. Anytime we're in the car, it was only oh, classical music. Yeah, I'm sorry. So what? <laughs> I'm sorry. What would you listen to at home? My my father, my, my parents had eclectic taste. And my father in particular. Oh, I don't even know where it is. Actually, I do. I think. Oh. I think it's somewhere in the attic. She so had a large record collection. So, and you know, every Saturday, every Sunday, I have vivid memories of him playing anything from Al Stewart to ABBA to Von Carrion and the uh, Vienna, um, is it Vienna Philharmonic Orchestra, Beethoven's complete symphonies, you know, reading the liner notes. I remember that, that was so much fun. Oh, it was so great. Um, uh, Barry White, who he adored, Marvin Gaye, and then, of course, anything that was on the radio. He, oh, just, cool. he loved music, all music. So I got very lucky also in that. He loved music. He loved pop culture. 
You know, so it wasn't just Star Wars. It was Star Wars. It was John Williams. It was Steven Spielberg. And he was very professorial. So I remember he loved to, you know, always reading Time Magazine, National Geographic. Uh, um, literally, he would read the, uh, we had two sets of um, encyclopedia editions, <laughs> you know, Britannica, whatever it was. And um, he would, he, he was just a, um, a um, uh, what do you call it? He was a. Um, he was an omnivore. It sounds like a, a total <laughs> omnivore, and and he had a voracious appetite for knowledge, right? So the evening news every night, you know, NBC. Tom, sorry, Tom Brokaw, um, sixty minutes. Um, you know, it, it's funny. He he wasn't he wasn't living and he didn't live long enough to kind of see what's you know going on. CNN, of course, he was able to 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 dig into that and all this. But he just had a constant curiosity and constantly in conversation uh, with those magazines and periodicals and with me, you know, more than my sisters. I had two sisters. You know, we would talk about Von Carrion and, you know, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony and this recording and what was happening at NASA at the time. And yeah, he was he was wonderful that way. Really cool. just brilliant. And if there were, you know, and, and if there was stuff that you chose to listen to, what would that be? Well, when I started making my own decisions, yeah, I was a teenager, mm -hmm. so my first decision, well, you know, I grew up in a very electric place, South Florida, so I started listening to, you know, Motley Crue, and, you know, it was kind of uh, white metal co culture down mm -hmm. there, so a lot of heavy metal, um, uh, Metallica, Motley Crue, but that's also how I learned how to play the gu guitar, and then, of course, yeah. I discovered Prince, actually, it was one of my older sister's friends, first came over with 1999, the, the record, and mm -hmm, opened mm -hmm. it up, and so provocative, so strange. So, you know, here's this man, woman, you know, just the picture. But then we played the record, and, you know, just incredible. Because to me, it was, up until that point, you know, my father, a few friends, some Haitian music, you know, but, you know, there was all these different musics happening, and then when I heard Prince for the first time, all of it made sense to me because I could, I immediately could tell what he was doing in terms of black music, white music, rock music, funk music, uh, even classical. It, it, I was like, oh, I recognized all of it really because of my father. And my father did as well. Oh, cool. Yeah. And so, so you, after elementary school, how did the kind of your progression on the violin, what did that look like? It went pretty quick. I mean, I was, I was, you know, I, had a certain talent for it, but I was playing a lot of instruments and still do, you know, but uh, I loved it, had a talent for it. I was in orchestras, I was in string quartets, but I was also in funk bands and rock bands and doing things with DJs and all sorts of crazy stuff like that. Interesting things like that, I should say. And then um, I just kept doing it, kept it separate though. And it wasn't until middle school where I had a teacher, Miss Griffith, who kind of challenged me to bring in my band with her mm -hmm. orchestra. She let me conduct. Then she let me actually write pieces for the two ensembles. Wrote a song for both ensembles, which was great. So I, again, I had a series of really wonderful teachers. Also a series of really bad teachers. I remember their names too. <laughs> Charles Noble, that's one in particular. Charles Noble, if you're out there listening. You did what was not bad do, about him? <laughs> he was terrible. It just, you, you know, well, we, we'll talk more about this, but he's one of those people that thought that power stemmed from volume and yelling and screaming and humiliation. Children, kids, you know. And I don't think he had got it. I don't think he ever understood. I don't know what his background was. Certainly he went through some trauma. He wasn't the worst of them, but he was, he was one of the first ones. You know, up until that time, music was joyous. You know, it was mm -hmm. us in a band. And Mr. Miller, Mr. Miller had a demerit system, but he never yelled at anyone. He never screamed. The one time he raised his voice, I don't even remember. I'm sure it was, it was so unusual, such an outlier in his usual behavior but not mr noble he was different he 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 relished even i would say in you know he he saw humiliation and dis and 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 um you know kind of um raising his voice to a room full of people in his charge as something well i'm sure it was done to him i'm sure it was his experience mm -hmm. and it was hard it, it, you know it's kind of terrible because then it became my experience. I thought that if you're a great musician, that's what you do. And he wasn't the only one. I had right. to keep saying that. And, you know, as I like to say, classical music, unfortunately, has many traditions. And one of them is trauma. You know, one of them is, is um, 
um, creating community by creating outcasts, you know? Never forget Mr. I think, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Mr. Noble. I made a mistake. We were playing Brahms Academic Festival Overture. I'm 10 years old. I'm in the second violin section. I made a mistake. And I remember he had me stand up and apologize to the orchestra. Can you imagine? And you know the worst part about it? The worst part about it was I knew it was wrong then and I couldn't articulate it, but no one defended me. Not even my stand partner. You know, that, that's well, you, there. He, he was 10 years old. When he, <laughs> well, no, no, I, no, I'm sorry. This was a Broward County Community College uh, Orchestra. Oh, I see. So my I stand see. partner was right. definitely a teenager. Definitely. Right. old. I was the youngest one in the group. And I'm sorry, I didn't paint the picture well enough. I was clearly the youngest person in the group. I was a child in a room mm -hmm. of young adults. And then and now, I remember nobody came to my defense. Nobody spoke up. Just let it happen. And by the way, I'm sure, I can't really remember, but I'm sure I was one of the only black people in the room, too. So I could have quit classical music right then and there. Who would have faulted me, you know? I, I mean, it's true, you know, if you think about the stories of Toscanini and how he terrorized, you know, professional yeah. orchestras, like, you know, there, yeah. there's probably, you know, some kind of tradition there. Um, yeah. But uh, in, in terms of your, you know, I mean, you had clearly a very eclectic taste. How did you think about, like, you know, did you think you had to choose one eventually or did you think were you trying to do them all pretty equally as, as time went on? I kept them separate because on the one hand, I was embarrassed to, <laughs> to admit to my rock and roll and funk friends that I played the violin. You know, in the 1970s in South Florida, little black boys did not play the violin. Just, there was no other plan that I knew of. That would get you beat up as a legacy. So white <laughs> girls did, you know, little white girls. Of course, so much has changed in, in 40 years. Um, and, um, but again, I had a great teacher in Miss Griffith who, who challenged me, who could understand the, that these weren't opposable ideas or even genres. In fact, she had so much foresight to, to appreciate me as as, you know, the trust that a middle school teacher must have had to say to this young Afro black boy, I'd like you to start conducting rehearsals. I'm not gonna go over here and drink coffee and read a newspaper, but I'm gonna stand right next to you and help you and be fully engaged, but you're gonna lead. And every day she would kind of step back a little further <laughs> to the point where I remember I turned around one day and she was sitting down just watching. I had kind of gotten into it. I mean, what, what vision she must have had. I remember when she told us she was retiring or going on to something else and it just, you know, I couldn't cry. I was too young to cry, manly, boyly, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> and, uh, but I wanted to because I, I knew, I knew she was special. I, and the reason I knew she was special is that she was leaving. She was leaving us. Kind of hope she's still alive. I don't know. Um, Linda Griffiths, Linda Griffiths. I need to try to find her, but I got lucky in that I had teachers like Mr. Miller, my um, her, um, el elementary school teacher, Ms. Hieronymus. I can remember their names, you know, um, who were so dedicated to, I would call it radical pedagogy. Mm -hmm. you know, again, they didn't have the words, I didn't have the words, but now I do. It was a kind of radical pedagogy where musical genres disappeared and we were focusing on what are you listening to? What are you most interested in musically? And how can you bring that into a classical music conversation or exchange of idea, an equal exchange of ideas? Oh, so I got great. lucky. That's great. Yeah. And, and so um, I know you ended up at Vanderbilt studying the violin. And how, how did you choose to do that? Somebody's asking me to speak more directly into the mic. Oh. <laughs> can you hear me OK? Let me <laughs> increase the gain. Oh, it's Michael. OK, Michael Friedman. I'm going to answer that question live. Um, <laughs> gotcha. I hope that's better. Let me know, Michael Friedman. Uh, let me know in the chat. And then what was your question, uh, Melvin? I'm so sorry. No, I mean, I'm just I'm just curious how you then made the decision to go study violin, study classical music. You know, that well, yeah, seems well, like a big, a big decision. Oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, in college? Yeah, in college, yeah, right. Yeah. Well, um, I, you know, I, I was studying music all through K through 12. And then actually in high school, I went to a performing arts high school, Dillard High School, the performing arts. God rest his soul. Um, 
Alvin uh, Pinkston, Mr. Dr. Pinkston. He was the supervisor in charge of all the music for Broward County. Thank you, Michael. Broward County, uh, Florida. He, I don't know what he did, but he got me out of one school, Coconut Creek High School. The names, right? <laughs> Coconut <laughs> Creek High School in Coconut Creek, Florida. Coconut Creek, Florida and Margate, Florida was not Coral Springs. <laughs> And I, I know this is this is when you know, what do you call it? This is a magnet school. So Dillard High School in Fort Lauderdale, Sunrise, Florida, was a magnet school. It was in a tough part of Sunrise. You know, crack houses. That show Cops. That show started literally behind my high school. I'm not joking. That's where that show Cops started, Broward County. And um, you know, Jason Derulo, Black Violin, all these incredible musicians came out of that same high school. But I was there first, I'm 50 years old. <laughs> and it was, it was tough, it was really tough. But we had young people from West Palm Beach, from Boca Raton, who wanted to go to Dillard, did go to Dillard. It was incredible, right? Lunchtime was open off campus and you go to McDonald's and there's somebody wearing actual pennies and they're penny loafers. You know, this young <laughs> white girl from Boca Raton who could sing. So that, it was wonderful in that way. It was also a way to kind of desegregate the school I don't know if they still do that, but or do that in South Florida or anywhere, but it's, it was different time. But be, because I went to this performing arts school and because it was such a great program, most of the of the students there who graduated went to New York or Chicago or L or L A. We all auditioned for Juilliard. Most of us got in. I got into Juilliard. Couldn't afford it. Once my father saw the bill, he's like, well, at the time I was also, I was working for two organizations, the Florida Philharmonic, now defunct, and Two Life Crew, Skylar Skywalker oh, Records. No kidding. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was doing summer internships and then stuff during the winter. Yeah, I worked for both organizations, which was great. Luther Campbell on the one hand, James Judd on the other <laughs> hand. It was kind of crazy to think about that. But, um, you know, I, I had decided, because I didn't get into Juilliard, or I'm sorry, because I got in and I couldn't afford it. Same thing with Manhattan School of Music. I decided I'm just gonna stay in South Florida and I'll keep working at Two Life Good Records. I was making good money. Luther Campbell personally wanted me to stay. He actually said, what are you gonna do in college? You know, what are you gonna learn in college that I can't teach you or something along those. He actually really cared. And at the last minute, Vanderbilt University sent me a letter. They had Black Student Weekend. That's eh, funny, that's what they called it. They flew you up there you know, a BIPOC student. Uh, you stayed with another student for the weekend. They paid for everything. You went to classes, so on. You got a taste of the school. I went, I liked it, I came back, and my father kept pushing it. He said, why don't you go to Vanderbilt for a semester? If you don't like it, come back, and I'll never tell you what to do. He drove me up there with, with my mother, his wife, and um, the, first, the first day I was hooked. I took a Shakespeare rep class day one. Of course, I had a really good education, you know, my fathers and others. So I already knew most of most of these. What did Bush call them? Shakespeare's. <laughs> but, you know, I think the first class was Othello, which was incredible, Othello. And um, uh, I know the opera. I knew the play, of course, uh, Verdi's opera, and of course the play. And I was hooked. The first day I was hooked. The first week I was hooked, and I never looked back. And I, of course, I got my doctorate from the University of Michigan. And now I'm teaching it. And so, what, so when ASU. you were at Vanderbilt, you were, you know, I mean, we we studied with the same violin teacher. So, I, you know, he's a very nice man. Chris how did Teal, you keep, yeah. How did you um, keep your other musical activities going? Well, when I got to Nashville, you know, that was that was a little bit of culture shock. It's much more diverse now, but it was it was different. I I, I was playing with some bands in town, Mystic Meditations, I think they were called. Excuse me, this new music group or world music group. And yes, we had the same teacher, Chris Teal. Chris Teal retired, I think, right? Yeah, he lives like, in Boston now, by the way. Does he really? Yeah, yeah, he lives in Cambridge. That's 15 minutes from me. I know, you should go find him. Oh my him. God, yeah. I thank you for telling me. Oh, man, I got to. Is, is he still married to that one woman or? No, he's married to somebody who teaches at the Harvard Education School. So that's okay, why great. They, Okay. Anyway, you should look him up. I'll I will look you, him I'll up. I'll send you your, your, his email. Please do. Yeah. He was, yeah, he was, you know, we played a couple duets together at one point when they brought me back as a visiting professor. Um, I, um, the, the way I kept them, I, I, again, I feel like I kind of got lucky. My first, that first week at Vanderbilt University, I started to say, okay, so I need to know more about black composers. <laughs> So I went to the music library and just kind of started looking them up. I discovered the Center for Black Music Research. And then I would say, wow, okay, I really want to understand Prince, not just the records, but the man and his career. So I started systematically studying the total 
careers, the lives of the musicians that I most admired. And really, a lot of time in the library, really trying to understand Brahms from the, you know, from birth, you know, the difficulties in his household, you know, playing in these very, you know, he played a lot. You talk about me, 15 years old, he's in brothels, not 20, 15, you know, he's helping the family by the time he's 12, 13 years old, you know, along with his bass playing father. His father, incredible bass player. Prince, same thing. Prince at 12 years old, can you imagine his father basically throws him out of the house. Hmm. He spends a couple nights on the streets of Minneapolis. At one point he calls his father from a payphone. Can I come home? Father's like, no. That led to Paisley Park, by the way. That's a whole nother story. Wow. <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, Prince, I mean, well, suffice to say, the musicians I most admired seem to have this incredible, these incredible stories of, of real um, desperation, poverty, um, real um, difficulty, um, tough households, you know? And I don't know, that fueled something. <laughs> And um, just going back to your question, I think at Vanderbilt, well, that always that made a big impression on me. I, I felt like at Vanderbilt, I had an opportunity to study at the Blair School of Music, which was very young. Mm -hmm. And I could maneuver that to do things at Belmont, which was a little more progressive and, you know, popular music program. Yep, do yep. things at Fisk. Do things on Music Row. You know, that whole Well, you, you were system. writing during this time, right? I was always writing, yeah. Uh -huh. But I was also writing, I mean, mystic meditations. <laughs> these were guys with, before I ever had dreadlocks, I used to have dreadlocks <laughs> or twists. These guys had long dreadlocks. And I, they were on my senior recital, <laughs> playing djembe drums alongside a chamber orchestra. So, yeah, I, I kept things separate by bringing these things together, by bringing musicians together, even in Nashville, even at Vanderbilt. Oh, that's good. I mean, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have to say, I mean, you know, I, I have a question because I, I want to contrast it to kind of the way I feel like I, I grew up, which is in terms of um, at what age were you aware of kind of your your ethnic and racial identity? And, you know, was that a conscious part of your thinking, you know, all throughout when you were growing up? Well, I think I think every BIPOC person, I think certainly every black person, there's a moment of racial consciousness. I can remember not thinking about, not even knowing I was black. And then one day, I'm, I think my parents said, hey, you know, five years old, why don't you go to the end of the block by yourself and come back? You know, one of these moments of trust. It's a different time. This is in, this is in um, Chicago. No, 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 this wasn't five years old. Yeah, it must have been Chicago. <laughs> thought about this it must have been Chicago and I get to the end of the block and I'm coming back and there's a man in a pickup truck now if I could still see him very so clearly and he um he had rolled his window down and he turned to me with a smile he said hey little n boy hey little n-word boy and then he rolled his window up and he kept driving and it was so it was so ominous and strange at first comforting, because I, I didn't know what that word was. Mm -hmm. I knew it must not have been a good thing. And um, his face, the sneer, it's kind of amazing how he has, you know, you know, I can still see his face. He may still be alive, he may have children. For whatever reason, he felt that he needed to say that to me. And I don't know if I want to thank him. All I can say is, by thank him, I mean, that was my racial awakening. And when I told my parents what happened, of course, my father's first reaction was to go find him. And that's when I knew, oh, that word. Okay, so that's a word that, hmm. Later on, my father, my mother, both of them, my parents explained it to me. Um, but um, I think every black person, every, every BIPOC person, has that kind of, um, how would you say? Moment. Tra tragic epiphany, <laughs> tragic, uh -huh. yeah, moment. Yeah, that, that kind of moment, that ominous moment, that unfortunate, that tragic moment where you are made aware of your minority status, at least in this country. I mean, it's, I, I would, it's very interesting to me because um, 
for myself, like you look back, at least for me, I look back on my childhood, right? And then you notice things at the, you, and you know, at the time when you're a kid, you have no idea that they're weird or incongruous or something, or yeah, I, you don't even notice the situation. Like, you know, this is a, you know, have you been uh, in Nashville to the Parthenon? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Several times. You know, so like I grew up in, you know, with the Parthenon, it's like, that's no big deal. And then you look back on it, it's like, what the hell is the Parthenon doing? Somebody it? really loved. <laughs> you, you know, like you, if you look back culture. on it, it's like, that's pretty weird, right? <laughs> and, you know, I, have to, well, yeah. I mean, yeah. I have to say that it was not um, until probably that I left Nashville that I even kind of thought about, you know, like, myself as an Asian in the middle of a, you know. Wow, in Nashville. No, and it, I mean, I have to say, because like, first of all, you know, there were not many Asian people in Nashville at the in the 70s when we were growing up, right? Like, wow. there were barely any. Um, and, and now that I, that I look back, it's also like, for example, the reason we went, to, we moved to Nashville was that my dad got a job. He was a chemistry professor, ah. right? And it wasn't until ah, later that, you know, I you know, he that I realized he worked his whole life at a uh, HCBU, HBCU. <laughs> oh, I did. where do you work? He, he started at Tennessee State for his whole career. Oh, I did. Oh, wow. That's you a, know what I mean? It's so like, I mean, so but but it never registered with me that any it was just like, OK, whatever, you know, <laughs> like I went to his, you know, I went to his office. I saw him teach class like wow. it just never it, it never occurred to me that that was anything you know, that was it. There was anything int remotely interesting about that, actually. <laughs> you know that's, what I mean? that's remarkable. What did your mother do? She worked at Vanderbilt, actually. She was a oh. she was a you know, she worked in a lab. Wow. Um, two scientists then. Two scientists. But so, mm. it, you know, I, I, it's just interesting that's that amazing. basically and, I, and it may be kind of me personally, rather than, you know, yep. a, a, di a different Asian person might have had a lot different more different and more conscious thoughts about this but sure but i just you know i just it's funny that i look back on it sometimes and i was like wow that's kind of weird you know like, that, was, yeah. like, that was kind of interesting well that's fascinating um wow i am <laughs> noticing uh melvin we have some uh questions oh yeah do you do you want to you want to you want to get to them sure let's see okay i satisfied michael friedman thank you sir and, <laughs> uh let's see martin beautiful name how important do you feel your creative music making experiences were to your overall musical life well, you know, there's South Florida then and now was very diverse. You know, we had actual garages and actual garage bands. Everybody kind of played what was on the radio, but we also played what our parents were listening to. So, you know, I had some Cuban friends or for, their parents were from Cuba. So we were learning Afro-Cuban music, <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know, Celia Cruz, Tito, well, that's more Puerto Rican. But, um, you know, we were we were we were learning the things that our parents were listening to and the things that were in the air. You know, my parents were from Haiti, um, everyone from, you know, Emmeline Michel to, gosh, all these artists that I just can't remember their names anymore, so forgive me. Um, and I think so. I mean, I think that um, specifically, I started composing when I was 10, and I kind of was always a band leader. Um, so... How do I feel my creative music making experience worked my overall musical life? Yeah, I, I think I'm a, I'm a much better, well, in some ways I'm still doing the same thing. I mean, I'm still working with DJs, I'm still working with spoken word artists, I'm still working with dancers and choreographers and filmmakers. And that's the environment I grew up in. You know, uh, there, was a, there was a group of us that if, this, if the teacher gave a kind of banal assignment, you know, tell us something about slavery. <laughs> I mean, really, we would get together and create a film. You know, I cast my father in the role of a slave owner. I mean, it was really kind of strange. <laughs> Hard, it, it, let me not do that to him. Uh, very, you know, we switched everybody's roles around. That's what I'm getting at. But the fact is, we, we were making little films and then scoring them, you know, VH, VH, VHS tape and then figuring it out, you know, putting it together. So we were hyper creative. And we had parents and teachers who supported that. So it was very important. It went well beyond classical music. And I'll tell you one thing, when I got to Vanderbilt University, here's a story, uh, Melvin, Joe B. Wyatt was the uh, 
uh, uh, provost, no, not the provost, the chancellor. Chancellor, I don't know if, yeah, right. if you remember this. Um, yeah. Joe B. Wyatt was the chancellor, and I wrote a piece. Well, the Vanderbilt Symphony Orchestra, or Vanderbilt University Orchestra, I can't remember. Um, they had a new conductor come in, John uh, Russell Morris, I think. He's doing really well, by the way. He's a great pops conductor or something like that. Anyways, he said, hey, let's commission you. I said, great. He said, what do you want to write? I said, I don't know. So I took a couple of days, and I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to write Haitian essay for orchestra. And I took... Um, uh, these Haitian folk tunes that my father would always sing. Uh, Merci, bon Dieu. la la nature porte um, Good, merciful God, look what nature has brought to me, a fisherman's tune. I took two of these Haitian folk tunes and I did a kind of Bartokian exercise to them, right? And put them into this, uh, what, seven minute piece I call a Haitian essay for orchestra. So here's the, here's the secret story, which I've never talked about publicly. Uh, I had to pay for every, well, I got a little bit of money from the orchestra, not much, but the deal was I had to kind of produce it. <laughs> it was kind of an interesting commission. So I had to figure out how to do the score. This is an early version of Finale, the score and the parts. I had to figure out how to pay for it. I went to Joe B. Wyatt. <laughs> I wrote him a letter. <laughs> really? I wrote him a letter. I said, I need X amount. Can you help me? And I can't remember who gave me the idea. Somebody gave me the idea. And he called me, he, he sent me a letter back having me come to his office. I don't think there was email yet even. I don't remember. <laughs> I don't think so, because I, I don't have a Vandy email address. I went to his office, we had lunch. At the end of the lunch, he gave me an envelope. And he says, look, this is for your composition. Just don't tell anyone it's from me. And I opened it up and it was like, you know, a pretty big size check and to, get the piece produced. But here's where it gets even crazier. It wasn't enough. Because the person I had coffee, the piece, I think he took advantage of me, asked for more. I didn't have it. So I went back to him. Can you imagine? And he called me for lunch again. And this time, this time his wife is there. And they both, we had this lunch at the very end. She has me an envelope. She says, take this. We want this to be successful. Let us know when the piece premieres. Can you believe it? And here's where it gets even crazier. If that doesn't crazy enough. <laughs> so I finish the piece, I pay everybody. Piece premieres at Vanderbilt, but it also premieres downtown. It just so happens the piece premieres the same weekend the former president of Haiti is in Nashville. Wow. And he comes to the piece. Yeah. <laughs> That's I can't amazing. Remember That's it is amazing. crazy. Oh, yeah. um, Jean Claude, I'll we'll have to look up. His Aristide, was it Aristide? I think it was Aristide, mm -hmm. who had a lot of controversy, believe me. Um, but Jean Claude, I met him, shook his hand, you know, <laughs> all these things. And uh, yeah, Haitian essay. That's, yeah. a, that's a great story. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, so I, I, I mean, I hope it's okay. I hope he's still alive. I don't know. But Joe B. Wyatt, a lot of very controversial guy for his way. His wife, John Morris Russell, oh yeah, Vanderbilt University. Because, by the way, Haitian essay, then the year, next year I graduated, but it got picked up by Michael Morgan and the Oakland oh. East Bay Symphony. Cool. And that was my professional debut, Haitian essay. I was what, 20, I don't know, 22, I, don't know, I can't remember. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yep, that's it. Oh, sorry, that was a long answer. I gotta give shorter answers here. No, I like, I yeah. like them. You wanna keep yeah. going or Let's should go we? I'll give, yeah, I'll give one minute answers. I was, okay, Martine, William, I was just curious as a composer and musician, how can we both as individuals and as communities introduce classical music to others and also introduce new ideas in classical music? Great question. Well. I think any, any introduce classical music to others. It depends on what classical music and it depends who the others are. But just trying to answer that question in a, in a general sense. I wouldn't start there. I would say to the others that you're wanting to introduce classical music to, and I'm assuming maybe they are not listening to classical music or not as much as you would like, ask the others, what are they listening to? Start there, right? Because whether it's hip hop music or rock music or tech, techno or funk music or whatever it is, they're probably listening to something that is just as complicated, just as rigorous as whatever it is you want to introduce to them. I'm, I'm, I'm reading into your question, but I'm trying to give you a solid answer that instead of starting with classical music as an introduction, start with what they're listening to. That's true. So to give a quick example of that, Beyonce's music is incredibly complicated. Uh, public Enemy music, incredibly complicated. Uh, the Weeknd, uh, System of a Down. Somebody introduced me the other day, yesterday, to Alex G. 
think it's Sandy, parentheses, Alex G. He, he's a kind of a Beck-like character. And as I was saying this, I was teaching at Dartmouth. Alex G is, I would say, this generation's Beck. Just as funky, just as quirky, but just as complicated, the complex harmonies, bitonalities, wonderful. Start there. And then I would say, ah, if, whatever you're listening to, that's wonderful. How about this? And connect it, right? So Beck, how about Satie, right? Beyonce, how about Brahms? Romantic, right? Um, and then the, the other part of the question was, and introduce new, oh, how do you introduce new ideas in classical music? Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. New ideas in classical music are happening all the time. But your question is, and also, oh, you're a composer and a musician. You have to rally the forces. I think there's two things, though. You have to, one, you have to believe enough in what you're wanting to do in classical music. In some ways, you're rallying yourself. You're rallying your own imagination. I wanted to play the violin a certain way, right? I don't have one pizzicato. I have 20 and counting. Right? A lot of the things that I do in terms of pizzicato stem from rock music and classical music. You know, it's hard to talk about these things in the abstract. I have my violin tree here, Melvin. Oh, nice. My violin tree. <laughs> All right, so here's a good old fashioned four string violin. So oh, you pizzicato. don't have the six, six string. I, I do right here, but I'm showing, <laughs> I want to prove the point. So here's the pizzicato that I learned. Meet of the, Chris Steele, right? There's your classic pizzicato. But here's a phaser. Can you hear that? That, I don't know if you can hear it. Mm -hmm. um, here's a sul ponticello pizzicato. Muted. Pizzicato with a wild vibrato. Same thing with the nail. More than pot pit, uh, bar talk pits, I think we all learned that, right? Uh, there's a there's a funky bass pit. Mm. Mm. Ah. Mm. Mm. Right. So there's three. So there's plenty of ways to approach the instrument that is radical. Now. Implicit in your question, you have to rally the troops, right? So um, filtering, that, that's, a good, that's a good thing to show. Um, where is it? Oh, filtering means, I, I learned, uh, oh, I've got too many bows. I have my bow tree. <laughs> I learned so to cello, right? Near or on the bridge. Actually, it's near the bridge. It's near the bridge, right? And then normal. I ask myself, what happens if I move the bow as I play? Get a filtering effect. No. Right, so nobody had said to me, move the bow as you play. That was a way of me, I'm using this term now, rally your imagination. And then by rallying my, my imagination and starting to write these things down, I could start to rally other people. And that's how you could start to introduce new ideas in classical music. Really think seriously about what you feel is missing. What do you love most about music? Bring that into classical music. Rally your imagination. Codify it. Perfect it. Notate it. Give it to someone else. I've never heard a symphony orchestra filter, Melvin. <laughs> never. I don't even know what that would sound like. <laughs> Maybe you, you know? should write something. Exactly. <laughs> so, you know, so that's, that's one way to do it, uh, William. That's one way to do it. Michael sounding good. Okay, Ian, how has, how has the radical pedagogy that you benefited from influenced the way you teach, compose, and play today? Well, my ear was quickly liberated. You know, I, I never saw classical music... I, I, I have never, and I don't see music scaffolded or in a hierarchical order. To me, it was circular. To me, it was a sea of music.
and classical music was just part of the ocean. So I, maybe that's not radical and things have changed in you know, 2021. I think things are much more liberal and progressive in music generally than they were in 1971. But to, to your question, I had teachers that, yes, were radical. I think Mr. Mello was radical. Not that he told me to plug in, but he didn't tell me not to. You know, Miss Griffiths, as I explained, that was pretty radical, entrusting me to rehearse and perform with the orchestra and bring my band into it. And Mr. Noble, in his own way, in his own way was radical in that he was so traditional that if there's one thing that I learned now is that as I say, tradition is nothing but an old innovation waiting patiently to be made new again. You know, we're at a time where artists are calling out presenters. Artists are saying, you will not treat me this way. And, and I'm taking your question, Ian, and just extending it a bit. As artists, as music students, Yale has a tradition. Arizona State University, where I teach, has a tradition. USC, Dartmouth, where I just taught today as well, has traditions. DePaul, I just spoke at DePaul this morning, has traditions. A lot of those traditions overlap. And one of them is the subjugating and the oppression of the original idea, right? Let me give an example of how radical pedagogy can happen right now. Replace the word rehearsal with something else. Everybody at these schools, ASU, Yale, you know what they say? They all go to orchestral rehearsals. Replace that word with something else. A jam, a communion, a conversation, a discussion, an improvisation, um, a war, a resolution, a, uh, an orchestral consideration, a prayer, a pr wow, right? Because the minute you change the word, then you can change the idea. Everything changes, actually, right? Uh, orchestral conversation implies that the musicians will come into the room and actually talk. Do you know how many orchestras I've played in and I could not tell you the name of the person right next to me? <laughs> I think that's a problem, right? So I think what I'm saying right now, Ian, is the, I'm the way that I am, and I think I, I benefited from radical pedagogy. Because I would say to you, Ian, why do you do the things that you do? Whose tradition is that? Who said that you have to play the violin this way and you have to participate in an orchestra this way? What if an, what if an orchestral, what if a student orchest orchestra got together one day and just said, no, stop, we would like to do this? What if an orchestral, or if a student orchestra got together online for an hour without the conductor online and just had a conversation about what you wear, what you play, right? What would, what would the conversation actually be? That's what I think should happen, Ian. I mean, Sorry, I, Marvin. No, 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 I think, I, I, but I think night, you're brother. saying in, in some ways, like, you know, <laughs> actually radical pedagogy is, is, should be just what pedagogy is, right? I mean, right. I think everything you've, oh, you're saying is- Oh, that's interesting. Is, Can you say that one more time? That's important. No, that radical pedagogy is just pedagogy, right? Uh, but but everything you were saying. Um, it, no, I would say it should be though, Mel. It should be no, it absolutely. Be, right. But I, but what you're saying is that um, what teachers need to do is to keep the minds of their students open, right? Yes. I mean, that's the at, at the at the core of what you're saying, and that oh, and that that um, mm -hmm. teachers should be inspiring students to to use their imagination to be open to new ideas to, you know, rather than be stuck in one particular way of thinking. Absolutely, I, I um, years ago I was in Tampa Bay. Tampa Bay has a lot of youth orchestras, they used to, used to. And I went to a orchestra and I said something, I got, on, I got on, on the podium, I said, hey, let's try this, sit wherever you want. <laughs> to the, you know, it was like 75 musicians in the room. Just sit wherever you want. Don't worry about your instrument. Melvin, it's incredible. First of all, they just changed the seating. It wasn't the half circle thing. But you had violin and oboe and clarinet and tuba. And, you know, what happened was people <laughs> sat to, next to people that they knew, totally based on friendship. And it was an orchestra. I've never seen an orchestra like this. And then I said, okay, let's play whatever you want. You know, let's play, what are you playing? You know, whatever. They were playing Bolero or something, I can't remember. 
it's uh, it was incredible. It was incredible to have you know most of the strings over there in the back. And you know, <laughs> I just realized that wow, what a simple suggestion. Even in the score, can you imagine as a composer, the score is dominant. What if I put into my score, the musicians can sit anywhere they want. That's the first thing, you know? But you're right. I think what happens is we get lost in a morass of, of, of a detrimental routine. You know, the teachers who should, and the educators who should be radical, get used to something. They get they right. they are victims in a way of tradition. I, I, I mean, I think it's 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 kind of under it's understandable in a way, right? Because totally. um, when when you're in a school, the the professor is there because they did s stuff a certain way, right? And so right. they're successful. So I think it's natural for a professor to say, "Well, the way I did it worked." So yeah. that's the way I want sure. my students to do it. You know exactly, I mean? <laughs> exactly. And we also have to. I think that. Um, you know, I think that we just have to redefine excellence also. You know, we, I think if, let me just pick on classical music for a second. Classical music at its best was about discovery. It was about a cultural documentation. At its worst, it was and is racist, right? It's about a cultural doc, doc, um, documentation of a certain gender, of a certain geography. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, name five African composers. I mean, there are more African composers than there are European composers. That's a fact. There are more <laughs> Asian composers than anyone. That's a fact. It's just true. But classical music has a narrow view of discovery and, and worse, worse, arbitrary rules, arbitrary rules. You know, I can play with anyone. You want to know why? Because I have very good rhythm. I can't always play in tune. <laughs> I can't, I cannot play Bach. But anybody, I, and I've tested this, I can play with anyone because I understand the rules of engagement. Some of them overlap with classical music, but a lot of it has to do with watching and listening and rhythm. And that's the thing. If you don't understand the cooperative rhythm, a cooperative. A lot of my approach to rhythm has to do with my work with dancers. A dancer's rhythm. If you can't understand that, I don't care. You can play in tune all day long. If you can't understand a cooperative rhythm, who are you going to play with? <laughs> so, I'm t I'm saying something really radical, and I don't. I, I should get to more of these questions, <laughs> but this is so great because I think the questions are so provocative. Oh, okay, Ian, I'm going to come back to you. Sue, uh, like, Sue, yeah, I mean, Sue, I, I think she's you, asking about one of your, your. yeah. Um, I mean, um, maybe you could talk about, uh, you know, some of the, briefly about some of the projects here, besides the Norfolk one, which is obviously sure. the most important. Um. It is, it is, no, I cannot wait. I'm, I'm slowly digging in, but, you know, unfortunately the story, you know, the, the, a nine-year-old nine -year girl in Rochester, New York was handcuffed and pepper sprayed in the back of a police car. That's going to make it into the piece. That happened Good. days yeah. ago. Yeah. So unfortunately, the piece is, you know, it, the piece is about um, tragic, iconic events um, that happen. I, I'll call them um, pas de deux, um, um, tragic pas de deux between people of color and law enforcement and iconic events like Philando Castile, who was, uh, his, his death was captured by his partner and witnessed by his daughter in the back seat. Um, like, of course, brother George Floyd, uh, like Eric Gardner, Trayvon Martin. So taking these real tragic life accounts, Breonna Taylor, and looking at the narrative, the actual transcript, what did the officer say? What did the victim say, the predator, the prey, if you will? And that that exchange of ideas and horror becomes a libretto that we are going to set to music for a string, a piano quartet. Piano, piano quintet, quintet and two voices. And two voices, male yeah. and female, embodying the, the people involved. And the difficulty is that, uh, and I, I think the, um, you, Melvin, and the Norfolk Chamber um, festival so much, music festival so much, and allowing me time to settle on which stories. That's the hardest part. 
for me, settling on which stories, because as you know, the hardest part for me, because once we settle on the stories, the music is there. You know, that nine year old girl, uh, I was trying not to do it. I was trying not to do it. Let's see. Hold on. Let me. Oh, I can. Everything's right here. Uh, everything's right here. I work. Well, what I'm working on right now is a piece for Apple, believe it or not. Um, it's a play called. Oh, it's a, uh, this is kind of private, but I guess it's not because it's going to be public next week, next month. The play is called Twelve Angry Men. Let's see if I can get that. Oh, it's going to be hard. Hold on. There we go. Twelve Angry Men and Women. And this is a play um, about real c accounts of horrible altercations between black people and law enforcement. There is an account of Breonna Taylor in that. So that's literally what I'm doing. That's what I was doing just a few minutes before we met, and that's what we'll be doing after. I'm doing um, incidental music to this play that is actually being filmed on site at Apple headquarters. Well, actually, it's the theater next to Apple headquarters. Um, um, uh, let me see if I am ready to. Uh, can you hear that? I think you can. Um, so when I when I say something like, um, "What is the sound? What is the sound of America right now?" That's a good thing. What is the sound of America right now, as far as I'm concerned, as a black Haitian and American composer living in it? Nice. A little bit. <laughs> we need we need music in a conversation like this. Right, right. <laughs> I appreciate right. that. Right. So that's 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 what that's what I would say. And um, oh god, I hope my night because I have everything. Part of I have everything mic, so that's actually an amp in the room. Okay, I'm reading about Cipher, which is described as a pocket opera for Philadelphia Boys Choir. Could DBR share a bit about this forthcoming work, the genre, the inspiration, why this group of young people? When will we get to hear it? Well, unfortunately, uh, soon, soon, soon on, soon, is that saying that right? Soon, soon on. The piece already premiered. I think you can see the video online. I'll try to Google search it. We are recording it. We're recording um, the, the music and making a film, a, a video around it. That's just starting. That'll, that'll be available before the end of the year. Um, but I can, and there's another iteration of the piece. Um, Arizona State University's chorus and orchestra did an excerpted, little truncated version of the piece with the great Mark Bermuthi Joseph, who did the libretto, as the uh, spoken word artist. And of course, Mark will be involved in this piece too and helping put the libretto together. Um, so I think you can hear it tonight. I'll see if I can find it. I, th I think it's online, or bits of it are online. Um, Cypher. Uh, I can say in 30 seconds, my Cypher started with a question. 
Two boys are born in Philadelphia. One ends up in the prestigious Philadelphia Boys Choir. One ends up in juvenile detention. Why? So I got 12 boys from a juvenile detention facility in Philadelphia and 12 boys from the choir to have lunch and have a conversation. That conversation became the libretto that Mark then added his own poetry to. And that became the piece. And, you know, it's funny, well, let me not go there politically. Philadelphia, if you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. But um, Philadelphia has been in the news because of this uh, <laughs> impeachment trial. But I, I wrote the piece because I was working and I, I continue to work with Opera Philadelphia. Philadelphia has its own problems and poetry and majesty. It does. Um, um, I did an opera called We Shall Not Be Moved that was based on the MOVE organization in Philadelphia. But I also felt, you know, I had an opportunity. Any commission is an invitation and a choice. And I chose to try to understand what happens to young boys in Philadelphia. Leave it at that. Okay, May Teen. I'm loving the instrumental approaches you're discussing. What's your experience been coaching young musicians and ensembles to rally their imaginations? Are there any institutions that have tried to make this approach a regular part of their pedagogy? No, <laughs> but but I do teach I do teach at Arizona State. <laughs> no, you know you want to know the soul of a university? Look at its curriculum. You want to know the soul of an orchestra or an opera company? Look at its programming. Um, I do teach at Arizona State University. I'm a faculty member there proudly. I do run what's called DBR Lab and DBR Lab Spaces, which are, play, which are courses that I teach that are available to undergrad and graduate students. And um, we're obviously radical pedagogy. My brand of radical pedagogy is taught. And um, when I coach young musicians and ensembles to rally their imaginations, I don't get asked to do that a lot, actually. But when I have been asked, um, I say three things. The first thing I say is, or I ask is, who's in charge? That's always a really interesting question. <laughs> you know, who's, who's the leader? Um, and you can imagine why. The and the reason I ask is because sometimes that question is, isn't, is vague. And I think that it shouldn't be vague. And I think that sometimes, I, I play in a lot of groups. And I know that if that question isn't, isn't um, settled and answer, answerable and addressed, it can lead to a lot of problems. You have to have clarity. It's fine if everybody's in charge, but you have to have clarity and you should say that if that's the truth. So I always say, who's in charge? Who, who's running the rehearsal? Does it, you know, is it, does it change each time? Is there one person? Fine. The second question I answer is, well, what's the goal? What's the goal of the group? And what's the goal of the rehearsal? What's the goal of the group? You know, what's the goal? It's really important, you know. Sometimes the goal is really clear. When I'm working with an orchestra, we've got four days, two rehearsals, the concert, a limited amount of time together. But then that's the third thing. The third thing is, um, is there an opportunity for us to, to make music but also have a conversation about it? I just, the last concert I did before COVID was with the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra, the great Marin Oslop conducting. And I asked her, I said, can I address the orchestra? Sometimes you can't, right, Melvin? Sometimes there's actually a union <laughs> prohibition against it. So um, can I address the orchestra? Yes. And then I say, um, is it OK if you and I have conversations in front of the orchestra when things aren't working? Great? Yes. And, and you know, it's wonderful because um, it allows me, and you can imagine, right, as a black composer and violinist in a piece called Voodoo Violin Concerto, it literally allows me, at times, to approach the orchestra as though it was a chamber group. And that's what I do, right? There's a moment in Voodoo Violin Concerto, many moments, where I'm playing with the cellos, or with the violins, or with the flutes, right? And in rehearsal, I face them. Because I'm plugged in, I don't have to turn my back. And sometimes it can be kind of disarming. I'm facing them, looking at them, wanting to move and make music with them. And I, you know, I had great teachers who always talked about bringing the orchestra to you. You don't conduct out here. You bring the orchestra to you. So, um, Martin, I wouldn't say that that's radical, as Melvin said. What's happening in that moment is that I'm bringing the DJ and hip hop music and how you work with dancers. I'm bringing a lot of different genres and a lot of different performance practices into a 20 minute orchestral rehearsal. And I gotta tell you, 
it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a heck of a thing to be playing pizzicato with the entire cello section. You just met them. They may not like or respect you, but I'm looking at them and I'm looking at their fingers matching their tone and suddenly, magically in a few seconds, we're together and everything's gonna be all right. Cool. Thank you, Daniel. I, um, we're, we're at time, but I, want, I wanted to um, say, see if you wanted to end our program and by saying something about um, you know, music and activism. And not actually, um, I think as a, as a person of color yourself and I think fellow uh, musicians that are people of color, I think they have no choice but to engage in that, right? right. But actually, I, want, I wanted to see if you m would say something about that to other musicians um, who might have not had that on their radar about, you know, how you think about it, how they should think about or not think about incorporating it into, into what they do and, and how they lead their life as a musician. Incorporating, I'm sorry, what? You, activism. Oh, activism, any, any, yeah. any part of activism. I'll say this, um, activism can be whispered. You know, activism should always be personal. It's fragile, I think. At its best, it's fragile. Because you're, maybe, Activism is trying to inspire change in places and people and spaces where change may be unwelcome or unwanted. It's fragile, it's personal. So I would say this, I would say that activism has such a vibrancy and such and so many different colors and possibilities. Activism can be the young violinist walking out onto the stage and saying to the audience, hello, how are you? My name is, and I'm so glad you're here. And then that person says the same thing again in another language. <laughs> Activism could be um, your, it, within your program note. It could be your name, comma, not your instrument, but I'm a black Haitian American composer. And as a composer, I farm and frame ideas. Activism could be pulling your conductor aside and saying, can we have lunch? Because I wanna talk to you about something that's really important to me that I hope is important to you. Activism could be going to the person who has the most power in your place, in your university, in your workspace, in your community, and saying, can we talk? Can we have a conversation? This is the change I'd like to see. Activism can be the next thing that you tweet. Activism can be the next thing that you repost. Activism can be the next time you have an opportunity to look somebody in the eye beyond the Zoom screen, that you say something to them with your eyes that isn't threatening, but, it's, but it is indeed welcoming. I think activism is always taking a chance. Great. No, thank you for, for your thoughts. Thank you for this hour. I mean, you know. Thank I, you, man. I, I, you know, it's inspiring to me. I'm always uh, enjoying talking to you. So I don't know when the next time will be, but um, I think the next time you're gonna write some music. Maybe. Yes, we are. <laughs> yeah. Sun Ann, Sun Ann. I'm going to write some music, and I think you're going to play it. I'll play it and record it, and then we'll we'll talk some more. Yeah, and then I'll, and, that, I'll and, and it'll be part of the piece, I think, this summer. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We're gonna yeah, the yeah. piece is going to have multiple movements, and um, yeah, I think it has to start with you, Melvin. And maybe there's even a, a talking part to the piece, so you're not just playing piano, but maybe you're playing piano and then saying something, or that maybe playing be. and saying something at the same time. Good. Yeah. But um, absolutely, yeah, we got to get this. Um, we want to start this commission off right. The many, it's almost chapters in a book, I think. Right, yeah. 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 Well, thanks again, Daniel. I know you're very busy, so I, I appreciate your time. Um, oh, my pleasure. And I look forward to the next time. We'll keep, we'll keep in touch. Thank you 
uh, all of you for all your great questions and for participating in this conversation. Yeah, send your questions to me on FaceTime anytime. Um, I'm easy, danielremain.com or just Google search DBR. And uh, Melvin, I hope we can do this again next month or in April. That would be great. Uh, yeah. you, you're busy, so. Nah, we'll I'm, make I'm, it. <laughs> Always time for you, Melvin. Always right. time. <laughs> MC. That's the greatest name. MC. <laughs> DBR and MC. I just said MC's in the house, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. <laughs> Yale, MC, and Norfolk Chamber Music Festival. It is at NCMF. I hope I got That's that right. right. <laughs> I hope I got that right. It's late. But uh, All right. thank you, Melvin. Thanks Always so a much. Pleasure. Okay. See you okay. Later. Till next time. Till next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.